Hello and welcome to today's Black History Month presentation, Making Their Way to Mexico, Reconsidering Black Mobility and Liberation in North America, sponsored by the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center and the University Library. I am Keith Rice, historian and archivist at the Bradley Center. The Bradley Center is a photographic and video archive that contains over 1 million images that document overlooked communities of color, primarily in Los Angeles, but also in Central and Northern California, the Deep South and Latin America. Before we start the presentation, I would like to introduce and welcome Professor Guillermo Marquez to say a few words about why he thought it was important for his Chicano Studies class to attend this presentation. <clears throat> thank you, Keith. Um, uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, so uh, students from my class, uh, Chicano Studies 245 History of the Americas, I thought it was important for them to attend this course. Uh, this month as part of Black History Month, we're discussing uh, aspects related to, uh, throughout the month, we'll be discussing aspects related to uh, slavery in not just the United States, but in the Americas generally. Uh, but as we discuss these themes and topics uh, in class, uh, this is a very important um, aspect of it because, uh, as we know, a lot of students are uh, familiar with the Underground Railroad heading north. Uh, this lights, uh, this shines a light on the other lesser known Underground Railroad, which uh, took many south to freedom into Mexico. So this is important for them to attend and to um, learn about as it will help um, broaden their understanding of resistance to slavery in the United States and broadly speaking in the Americas. Thank you, Guillermo. Mm -hmm. Now for a little background about today's presenter. Dr. Maria Esther Hemick received her doctoral degree in May of 2021 from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Hemick is the 2021 to 23 Broder Posta postdoctoral fellow at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Mexican scholar and public historian who works center, center and connects through a gender lens, the histories of liberation and abolition in North America and the black diaspora in Mexico. She is currently revising her first book, Channels of Libera Liberation, Black Freedom Across the US Mexican Global South a work that examines and recovers the transnational experiences of Black Americans situated as freedom fighters who left the United States for Mexican spaces. This presentation will introduce us to the hidden history of the Black American experience in Mexico during slavery. Dr. Hammack will take us on a journey on the lesser known Underground Railroad to the South beyond the US border. She will highlight, highlight how Black liberation connected and shaped and continues to shape the histories of Mexico, the U.S., and Canada. Additionally, Dr. Hammack will show us how Afro-Mexican communities today are not only leading the recovery and preservation of their legacies, but continue the fight to access resources, most importantly during the pandemic times. So, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Maria Esther Hammack. Thank you so much. I am uh, very excited to be here and to be have been invited to this space. Uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Jose Luis Benavides and Dr. Um, Kevin Rice for, for just opening the space for me to have this conversation and share some of the work that I've been doing um, for what feels like an eternity, but you know, for the past you know seven uh, years. And so, um, so let's begin. Um, and I hope you all enjoy it. And uh, so we'll start first by, um, I wanted to show you, sort of um, lead you to the maps on the screen. Uh, these are maps that I created just to give all of you a, um, a visual of some of the geographies that I'm going to be highlighting throughout the talk so that you can situate those geographies um, as I speak to see, you know, to see it on the screen. So uh, this is one of the maps where I, um, hopefully this offers you a visual for understanding this, this uh, liberation geographies as well as this one. So uh, that's one of the things to show you the geographies to point you to them. And the other thing is throughout this talk, I'm going to be um, talking about freedom fighters and I, one of the things that I do with this, the, the larger work that I, uh, I'm working on is um, situating people who left the United States, people who were escaping bondage uh, 
and, and leaving um, US spaces for Mexican spaces. Uh, to claim freedom, I situate individuals as freedom fighters with the idea that terminology is very important and the language that we use is very important, given that um, terminology like runaway slaves and fugitives is very much a terminology of the institution of, of chattel slavery. And so I wanted to resituate and recenter uh, Black Americans who claim freedom outside of the US as um, with, with language that really centers their experiences and their fight uh, for liberation. So those are the two things that I wanted to point out before I begin. And so without further ado, let's begin. So I wanted to start this presentation by uh, sharing a little bit about the story of a black woman, uh, an African woman who I regard as a freedom fighter and um, who challenged her enslavement, utilizing what she understood to be Mexican law, you know, utilizing the laws of the country of Mexico to claim freedom, or at least to fight for, for her freedom uh, at the very many levels that she was able to. Um, her and her story can offer us a door to, to, that allows us for a better understanding of not only what Black liberation is, uh, but particularly um, what, how, how Black liberation connects and connected and shaped uh, the histories of Mexico and the United States and largely the histories of uh, North America. So Isabella arrived in Mexican Texas in 1828. She was smuggled to Mexico by a well-known and prominent slave trader by the name of James Fanning. Um, she was part of a larger group that had been um, bought in the Caribbean, perhaps in Cuba. It is not, uh, the record doesn't really tell us exactly where, but she was uh, brought into Mexican Texas illegally um, in 1828. And I'm, you know, Jesus. saying, Jesus. and I'm saying illegally Someone. because after 1824, um, it was illegal to bring in enslaved persons into Mexican territory. Mexican abolitionists, for instance, passed the Federal Act of July 13th of 1824. And this law, as of July 13th of 1824, prohibited the introduction of enslaved people from any foreign country into Mexican territory, including the Texas province. This law was very specific and stated that, and I'm quoting, if enslaved persons were brought by anyone, including Anglo settlers, the enslaved person would become free by the mere action of having set foot on Mexican territory. Yet, as we will find out today, um, or as history has shown us, unfortunately, in spite of these prohibitions, in spite of this law in 1824, um, people continued to be introduced into Mexican spaces um, illegally and, and as uh, slaves. And so Isabella was part of these histories and she was brought into Mexican Texas, um, you know, unlawfully and uh, remained enslaved even though the laws uh, were there, were set there for her to, you know, be able to claim her freedom. And so a lot of these uh, tensions that uh, Isabella arrived in the space, uh, well, a lot of the tensions that were going on during the time that Isabella arrived in the space really were um, tensions created by this clash between slavery and freedom, between Mexico offering freedom to people who were enslaved in other spaces and um, the, the, the way that the Mexican government offered uh, Anglo settlers uh, the ability to move into Mexican spaces. And so this created a lot of clashes. So for instance, a lot of the tensions and contentions that were brewing in this space where Isabella arrived in 1828 were because of the push for abolition legislation coming out of the Mexican Congress. By 1829, Mexico had abolished slavery, uh, or by 1824, Mexico had abolished the illegal slave, the, the slave trade, and by 1829, Mexico had abolished slavery. <clears throat> And uh, this created a lot of dissatisfaction. And it was so forceful that by December of 1829, Mexico opted to appease um, slaveholders in Texas and offered them an exception to the abolition laws. 
But before I get a, um, you know, ahead of myself, I did want to um, explain a little bit further where is you know the the space that Isabella arrived at. And sorry, I lost track of my of my um, notes here. But during this time, Isabella arrived in Mexican Texas, as I said, in 1829. And um, she understood that she was brought enslaved and she understood that the Mexican laws offer her pathways to freedom. Unfortunately, by 1836, uh, these tensions had created a lot of rifts in Texas that, um, that Isabella truly uh, experienced. For instance, in 1836, um, the Texas Revolution had broken up and Isabella was taken by her enslaver to Louisiana. So at that point, Isabella, once she reached Louisiana, she hired an attorney and uh, sued her enslaver for her freedom. And in her suit, she actually argued that, hey, I was brought into Mexican Texas after 1824, and I know that by the laws of that country, I should be free. Instead, the enslaver that had brought me sold me and that, that enslaver brought me to Louisiana. And even though when I am a free woman and she kept claiming that she was a free woman based on the Mexican laws. And she was so forceful that her case made it all the way to the Louisiana um, Supreme Court. And so in the, at the Supreme Court, um, uh, she continued to insist on her freedom based on Mexican law to a, a, at some point, um, she even had her attorney write to Waddy Thompson in 1835, uh, who was at the time the US minister to Mexico, arguing that she was a free woman based on Mexican law and that she hoped that to get his support um, to gain her freedom. And so Waddy Thompson, what, what he responded was that he had no idea that in Mexico, these laws were, were so, and so that unfortunately, um, that because Mexico could not corroborate uh, about this freedom that she was claiming uh, that the laws of Mexico offered, that he could not support her, um, her petition. And so it, it, is, it is interesting that, or it is a question to ask if Wadi Thompson actually sent um, uh, correspondence to Mexico asking for clarification of the laws or if he didn't. But the point of the, um, of the case was that um, the response that Wadi Thompson, Thompson sent to uh, Isabella's attorney was that um, he, and he says that he did not know about Mexican laws and that she, he didn't know that she would be freed uh, based on those Mexican laws. And so unfortunately, Isabella did not um, claim her freedom. She was not allowed to claim her freedom mainly because the judges that were presiding over her court case argued that they had no knowledge that in Mexico uh, freedom was available after 1824 or after 1829. And remember, this is 1836. Um, and actually, when, when the last decision of Isabella's um, case uh, was decided, was in, it was in 1842. And so she kept fighting for, uh, for that freedom between you know as early as 1836 all the way to the 1840s and so unfortunately her claims were denied and um but even when her claims were denied this story is significant not because she lost her case but or even you know if she had won it but because it reveals that individuals who were um fighting for freedom uh, did did understand uh, the spaces they were at, the laws that, uh, that these spaces were uh, governed under. And I have been looking for more records uh, to help us better understand Isabella's story and experience. Um, one, when you know, there is a mention in the case that Isabella sent letters to Mexico or, or Isabella's attorney sent letters to Mexico asking for assistance. And so one of the questions is, did Mexico ever respond? Did Mexico ever get, a, you know, um, get the, the petitions? Uh, did the US consul send letters to the Mexican authorities? Um, and so if Mexico had responded, that's another question. If Mexico had responded, would Isabella have been able to attain or secure her freedom? And I guess we will never know if um, all these ifs, but the important part is that uh, black women like Isabella 
uh, across this space, this global space, uh, consistently and regularly fought for their freedom at the very many levels that they could, particularly you know, in the courts, they tried to secure their freedoms by suing their enslavers for the freedom that corresponded them. So stories such as Isabella's are foundational to our knowledge and understanding of the US-Mexico borderlands. But importantly, um, to the shared histories of the US and Mexico through, a, you know, because it offers us lenses um, that are in many ways tools to fight the historical erasure of underrepresented communities and voices, uh, tools that, are, that also can help us challenge anti-Blackness uh, on both sides of the border. And so Isabella's story is part of a larger study um, that I am working on that centers on the Black experience in order to bring forth different perspectives on the ways liberation was forged um, and shaped in North America. And so, so moving forward, I really wanted to highlight briefly the long process of abolition, um, consistent but long process of abolition that took shape in Mexico to, you know, to, that allowed for women like Isabella to fight for their freedom, even when they, uh, she may have not attained it, others actually did. So liberation and abolition, you know, liberation, abolition and anti-slavery initiatives were very much part uh, or procured in Mexican spaces as early as the 1820s, even amidst all of the frontier changes, and especially as independence from Spanish control was sought from the people of Mexico. As many of you may know, uh, Mexico's independence from Spain was a long process as well that took over 10 years uh, between 1810 and 1821. But throughout this process, a lot of factions and leaders who came to power in the name of independence were very intentional uh, about abolition, um, about abolition and about abolishing slavery in Mexico. Freedom was always at the forefront for all Mexicans, Black, Native, and Mestizo alike. So in this slide I've placed in front of you, um, I give you sort of like uh, some of the main legislation, so the legal abolition process that, uh, that was procured in Mexico through laws and decrees. And um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, comment here, as you see, you know, read some of these laws, is that um, the leaders that were pursuing the independence from Spain, um, they were not only procuring to be free from imperial rule, but ultimately people that were doing this fighting were a lot of people who were of uh, African ancestry themselves. They were black, native, many of them had been enslaved or their, their parents, grandparents had been born enslaved in Mexico. And so it was only logical that if um, people were fighting for freedom, for the freedom of the country, they also wanted to be able to be free in that country. And so a lot of this legislation that you see on the screen was um, certainly shaped by, this, uh, by these individuals who had a vested interest in ensuring that Mexico uh, stood in anti-slavery. And uh, you can start seeing how legal abolition was um, procured. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'll give you a few, um, a few um, insights into some of these laws. For instance, on um, November 29th of 1810, Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, who was one of the leaders of independence, issued one of the first decrees that abolished slavery in Mexico or that attempted to abolish slavery in Mexico. And I say attempted because a lot of these decrees, you know, this was a very contentious uh, process of, uh, of independence between 1810 and 1821. So some of these decrees were issued and they had to be constantly reissued by the new leaders that were taking up the movement. But for instance, in 1829, in 1810, November 29th, 1810, Miguel Hidalgo stated that, and I'm quoting, the selling of men was against the claims of nature and therefore slavery and all laws pertaining to slave acquisition, trafficking and commerce were abolished in the entire nation. Um, another very important law was in 1821 and I have uh, added here in a box for you and there was 1821 and 1822. These two laws are particularly important because 
they guaranteed citizenship to all people, including Mexicans of African descent. The 1820 law, for instance, stated that all inhabitants of Mexico, without distinction of being Europeans or Africans or Indians or mestizos, had the freedom to pursue their lives according to their merits and virtues. And the 1822 law stated that, and I'm quoting, no government document is to classify citizens by racial origin. And thus every person living on Mexican territory was henceforth to be considered without distinction, a citizen even on paper. And now I wanted to highlight these two laws because they are very telling, um, given that in the United States, throughout this antebellum period, throughout this period, the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, well, 50s, you know, uh, as I will mention in a few minutes, citizenship for Black Americans was often denied or not on the table until 1868 with the passing of the 14th Amendment. But it is important to note that in places or spaces like Mexico, um, citizenship was not off the table. It was often a consideration. It was there, um, particularly this racial, um, uh, the, this the 1822 law that it takes away these racial classifications. And that one is a very important law to note given that um, it was one of the laws that was you know, passed to as an anti-slavery stand, you know, as an anti-slavery legislation, as a tool to get rid of the caste system. But in turn, throughout the 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 nineteenth century, and and all the way through the twentieth century, this law became sort of like one that turned to be a, a tool that engendered more erasure because because of these particular laws that were implemented early on. Um, that said, no, no person is to be classified by racial origin. In, in our censuses throughout the 20th century, for instance, no one was classified as, as Black or any, anything else other than Mexican. And so it became a tool that really did, um, um, you know, hindered uh, by the 20th century as opposed to what it was intended to do to help and be, and you know, to help and be part of this process of anti-slavery. But uh, in general, the this uh, I hope that this visual offers you this um, understanding that about the the process of uh, legal abolition in Mexico that took shape in the country and uh, through throughout the 1820s and beyond this, I do want to stress out that. These were federal, a lot of these were federal uh, legislation and decrees that were being passed, but also at the state levels in Mexico, each state had, uh, had started to abolish slavery in, in, through individual um, uh, constitutions as you know, throughout the 1820s as well. So I'm gonna mention a few, for instance, Chiapas abolished slavery in 1826, Chihuahua abolished slavery in 1825, the state of Coahuila, Texas in 1827, uh, Durango in 1827 as well, uh, Mexico City or the Estado de Mexico in 1826, Guanajuato in 1826, Jalisco 1825, Michoacán 1825, Nuevo León 1825, Oaxaca 1829, Occidente, which was the state of Sinaloa and Sonora together, uh, they abolished slavery in 1825, Tabasco 1825, Yucatan 1825, Zacatecas 1825, um, and uh, I think I said Guanajuato 1826. So you start seeing this process taking shape not only um, federally in this new Republic of Mexico, but also individually across each state, across the board. And so um, I hope that this offers you a new perspective on you know, this process of legal abolition and decrees that took shape in Mexico. And so even, and I do want to point out that even though this um, legal process of abolition was being produced and proffered and prompted throughout the 1920s, the 1820s, this whole process also became very contentious for Mexico. Because as abolition was being forged and framed, the country also began to allow Anglo settlers from the US to move to Mexican territory. 
as I briefly mentioned earlier, and most of these settlers, um, you know, were coming in from slaveholding U.S. spaces, and so a lot of these individuals who were moving to places like Texas were also very interested in bringing in uh, people that who they considered their enslaved property. But because Mexico was in the process of organizing it itself in the 1820s, you know, they were passing these laws, but in in these processes. Um, and, and particularly right after securing independence, at first they really had no law set to prohibit slavery in the new nation. So they started uh, officially 1821, 1822, as you see here. And as Mexico, but as Mexico realized and, and offer certificates for, for Anglo immigration, particularly in Texas, they, they started to see the need to abolish slavery. And so this process that you see in the screen were prompted by also these other processes that were taking shape in the country, such as Anglo immigration. And so as Mexico realized that Anglo settlers were moving to Mexico and bringing in enslaved persons, they were like, okay, we, uh, we, we certified some of these land grants of like people like Stephen Austin um, and other Anglo settlers, but we really need to make sure that those contracts abide by the laws that we're going to be implementing um, that are going to be anti-slavery. And, so, um, and so this, as you will see in a minute, started creating a lot of animosity between the Mexican government that was passing this anti-slavery legislation and Anglo settlers who were hoping to come to Mexico or moving already to Mexico um, and, and uh, really wanting to bring enslaved peoples into the country. So slaveholders, particularly those moving to Texas, um, even after, for instance, this law that was passed in 1824 that prohibited the introduction of enslaved people into Mexican territory from any foreign country, they began to panic and uh, because they did not wanna lose their property. Uh, property uh, in enslaved persons was very profitable and so they began to circumvent or find ways to circumvent the laws, particularly this, this law in 1824 on July 13th that prohibited them, them from bringing in enslaved persons. One of the ways that people started to, to circumvent the law was um, creating contracts with enslaved persons by saying, actually, we are bringing these individuals to Mexican territory but they're not uh, enslaved. They're actually servants and here's their contracts. They have willingly signed this contract where they are agreeing um, to be servants for 99 years. And so many of the times um, enslaved people didn't even know about these contracts, but that was one of the ways that slaveholders was a were able to circumvent Mexican law by presenting these contracts and saying, for instance, women like Isabella, uh, who were smuggled into Mexico um, during that time, uh, slaveholders were saying, oh, no, no, women like Isabella are not uh, enslaved. They're merely servants for life. And so that was one of the ways that uh, slaveholders were able to circumvent Mexican law during this time. And these actions, you know, only intensified animosity between Texas slaveholders and the Mexican government a government that you know, had, as I showed, pro, um, uh, consistently been uh, standing anti-slavery, in anti-slavery stance um, and um, offering legal abolition. So as these processes were being propelled forward, Mexican officials were often um, also very active, not only in passing uh, anti-slavery legislation as we saw in the previous slide, but were often active in writing condemnations of the institution of slavery, particularly the centrality of enslavement in the Texas rebellion. Um, it's important to note that until the annexation of Texas in 1845, Mexico continued to consider Texas as still part of its republic. And so in this particular uh, excerpt that I'm showing up here, we have a Mexican official uh, by the name of Sebastián Camacho, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, condemning slavery, particularly during the Texas Revolution. 
<clears throat> he was condemning uh, Texas hold and the protection of slavery by Texas, Anglo-Texans. Camacho declares here that Mexico could never lend itself to an act equivalent to the sanction and acknowledgement of slavery and the traffic of human beings, which he considers a traffic uh, that horrorizes humanity. And so this is part of this um, um, animosity that began brewing, particularly with this space that was um, Mexican Texas. You know, Mexico had started to abolish slavery, as I mentioned, but slaveholders were bringing in enslaved persons illegally and extra legally. And so this only created a lot of contentions that led to the Texas Revolution. And one of the, the things that um, is often historically erased is the centrality of slavery in, um, in, 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 um, in the processes that led to the Texas Revolution. But slavery was very Post much, survey. but slavery was very much a, um, a factor that led to these contentions, that led to this break between sla slaveholders in Texas and uh, anti-slavery factions in Mexico that were attempting to rid the country of slavery. And so um, this is to show, and I'm showing this, this brief excerpt to show that beyond merely writing um, uh, legislation that was um, uh, anti-slavery, you know, Mexican officials, Mexican people were often uh, writing about um, the institution of slavery, writing condemning the institution of slavery. Mexican officials were reaching out and connecting also, uh, not only writing, you know, for the for the sake of writing about uh, you know their condemnation or their their anti-slavery stance, but they were creating networks and connections with black abolitionists in the United States to find ways to um, to find solutions, to find ways to um, abolish slavery and, you know, um, create more networks to empower, you know, or, or to challenge um, the institution of slavery in the United States. And so, and I will talk a little bit more about uh, here about these connections. Uh, people in Mexico who were, you know, pushing this legislation that we, we've seen, you know, uh, in, 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 in Mexico, taking shape in Mexico federally and in the individual states were really pro propelled not only by Black Mexicans, but by, you know, Vicente Guerrero was a Black Mexican, Juan Alvarez was a, one, uh, uh, a Black Mexican who, you know, both of them were presidents of Mexico. And I guess I should note that Mexico has had several Black uh, Mexican presidents um, when we, you know, the U.S. only has had one, and very recently, but uh, when it, Vicente Guerrero was president in 1929, and I guess I'll show and show you. Um, this is Vicente Guerrero right here. He was president in 1929, and this is Juan Alvarez right here. He was president in the 1840s, and so. Um, but back to this uh, networks created by um, Mexican abolitionists and Black abolitionists. Um, in 18, so for instance, in the 1830s, um, there were these networks being created um, by abolitionists in Mexico and in the United States. For instance, what I'm going to talk about here is in 1833 or, or early in the, in the early 1830s, uh, the Mexican government established a, an embassy in uh, Philadelphia. And one of the reasons for that was because they wanted to be informed about what was going on in the anti-slavery conventions in Philadelphia. And several Mexican officials were attending the abolitionist conventions in Philadelphia and reporting back to Mexico saying, this is what's going on, this is where we stand. Um, and so with this, uh, uh, with, with this, I guess, visits and uh, attendance in these conventions, the Mexican um, officials were trying to connect and find ways to support um, black abolitionists. In 1833, for instance, the then vice president of Mexico, Valentin Gomez Farias, wrote to Samuel Webb, a black abolitionist located in Philadelphia. And in his letter, Gomez Farias said, and I'm going to quote his letter, if they, black Americans, would like to come 
Mexico will offer them land for cultivation, plots for houses where they can establish towns and tools for work under the obligation that they will obey the law of the country and the authorities already established by the Supreme Government of the Federation. And what you see on the screen right there is actually the initial inquiry that was sent by, uh, to Gomez Farias by Samuel Webb in August of 1832, which is what prompted this response by Gomez Farias declaring that next, what Mexico had to offer. And so for instance, uh, Samuel Webb uh, basically asked a few very important questions of the, of the vice president of Mexico, which at the time Gomez Farias was acting president because uh, Santana was the actual president, but he was never you know, there, he was always elsewhere. So uh, Gomez Farias was acting president, even though in essence he was vice president. But he, um, the first question was, you know, and, and this is the first question right here, he really wants to know, Samuel Webb, Webb wants to know, would black immigration to Mexico be well viewed, received by the federal government and the Mexican people in general? The second question was, would people of color be able to be considered equal to those who are not people of color in Mexico? How long will it take for Black Americans to have their rights to attain full citizenship? And again, this idea of citizenship continues to, to be very important throughout this process, throughout the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, um, particularly for Black Americans seeking to go to Mexico. They really wanted to know if citizenship was on the table because as opposed to what we see in Mexico, in the US, citizenship was not on the table for black Americans, at least until uh, 1857. Well, actually not even 1857, you know, it was uh, particularly denied after 1857 with the Dred Scott case. And so the last question that Samuel Webb asks is how can they make sure to, they, you know, how can black Americans make sure they can obtain property, lands, and how can they buy them? And so this really tells us a lot about um, what Mexican freedom uh, consisted of or, or what Mexican freedom had to offer. Um, it, it offers us sort of like a way to understand what may, Mexican freedom may have looked like for black Americans uh, seeking to move to Mexico. Certainly for those considering going to Mexico um, uh, to escape uh, enslavement or the um, restrictive laws that were being implemented, not only across the South, but across the US North as well, throughout you know, the period before um, 1865 in the US. And so as these discussions and connections link, linked black abolitionists in the US and Mexican abolitionists, let's remember what was going on you know, in Mexican Texas. So don't forget that, that Mexican te Texas was becoming this very contentious space um, at this point, Mexican Texas was being fashioned into a space that was truly, or rather that was transforming um, this, this space to, to being a slave country. And um, I want to stress this idea of Texas was a slave country because those were actually the famous words declared by Stephen Austin in 1835, right uh, before he you know, decided to lead these Texas revolts um, and the, the lead Texas to break away from Mexico. And so, um, so just keep this in mind because it is important to understand that slavery was a very uh, central aspect of this break between Texas uh, um, and, and from Mexico. And even when a lot of the times we don't learn this in school. And so before I move on uh, from a Mexican abolition um, and go straight to who were people leading this movement and this fight for freedom in Mexican spaces, I wanted to highlight this, um, this letter, for instance, a lot of the decrees that were prompted. Um, I want to point out one law that before we, we dig into this uh, letter, one law that was added to the Mexican constitution in 1857. Article two of title one of section one was one that declared that, and I'm quoting, in the Republic of Mexico, everyone is born free. The slaves who set foot on national territory regain just by doing so their freedom 
and therefore have the right to the full protection of Mexican laws. And so that was the law. And this is very important to acknowledge, given that this is 1857, the same year that the US denied citizenship for Black Americans in the US with the Dred Scott case. And this law has a, a, had a very long history. Um, you know, this was passed in 1857, but this law was prompted by a lot of the uh, things that were happening in Mexico as early as the 1820s. For instance, throughout the 20s, from the 1820s to the 1850s, requests, thousands of requests from local, state, and federal authorities from the US were arriving in Mexico. And these requests were demanding for the extradition of treaties for the return of formerly enslaved persons back to the US. In the US, slaveholders were losing a lot of money and they were very intent in either getting people who they considered their property back. Um, even when these individuals uh, they wanted back were no longer enslaved, they were actually free women, men and children living in Mexico. But for instance, in 1827, um, Henry Clay sent one of these requests to Mexico, urging and procuring a stipulation for the Mexican government to restore whom they considered runaway slaves. This request had, to, had also called for reciprocity. Um, Clay wrote that the US promised to return runaway slaves to Mexico in return for Mexico to do the same. At this time, uh, you know, at this, at this odd request, Mexican, the Mexican government was very confused um, as I was when I first read this request, uh, but bear with me in a minute and uh, it will become very clear. Two Mexican abolitionists responded back to Henry Clay and that was Andres Quintana Roo and Jose Maria Tornel. Quintana Roo and Tornel responded that not only there were no slaves belonging to Mexico on the frontiers adjacent to the US, but that the US, that the US actually could restore to Mexico um, but that the country stood behind the belief that enslaved people have the inalienable right, which the author of nature has conceded to them to procure their liberty. And that, and I'm quoting, Mexico has the intent to erase the slavery stain from the Mexican Republic in order to preserve its institutions. And this was 1828, so you remember, even before Mexico abolished slavery. Clay's request was not only refuted, but rejected, actively rejected. Quintana Roo's and Tornel's response was not the only thing prompted by this request. Additionally, on May 21st of 1828, a couple of months after they had received uh, this Clay letter, uh, the Mexican Congress officially rejected all other requests submitted for consideration during that spring by US officials, including the treaty requests written by Joel Pons Poinsett that uh, a treaty that had uh, called for, and I'm quoting, the restoration of fugitive slaves to the US. And again, Mexican abolitionists stressed to Poinsett and Clay that it would be most extraordinary, and I'm quoting here, it would be most extraordinary that in a treaty between two free republics, slavery should be encouraged by obliging ours to deliver up fugitive slaves who are free people to their merciless and barbarous masters of North America. These diplomatic clashes between Mexico and the US arose because of the significant number of black Americans who were leaving the US, leaving the plantations, leaving bondage and going, heading down to Mexico, making their way to Mexico to be free. There were countless of people. And I argue in my work that their pursuits and their mobility is what truly drove and at times forged Mexico to fully embrace abolition and to finally do so federally in, the, in, in 1829, um, even when in 1829, next, the Mexican government did decide. So they passed abolition on September 15th, 1829, but by December they had given an exception to slaveholders in Texas. So really this, this abolition of slavery in 1829 was very fragile because they added one exception that allowed um, or a piece, I should say, slaveholders in Texas. And of course, we all know what happens when with appeasement, a lot of the times it doesn't work as we've learned from history. And um, this exception that was given to the slaveholders in Texas by December of 1829, 
did not prevent the Texas Revolution as Mexico quickly learned. And so um, and on the contrary, it just exacerbated these this issues. And so uh, by 1837, it was actually in 1837 when Mexico decided to, you know, right after the Texas Revolution, the rebellion had happened. Um, the Mexico had lost this rebellion. And so would Mexico, Mexico, even though they lost the rebellion, they still consider Texas part of Mexico. So what Mexico turned around and did is pass the, uh, a law, uh, the abolition of slavery law in 1837 that stressed very clearly that slavery was abolished in all of the Republic, but this time with no exceptions. And this was really indirect response to the rebellious factions in Texas. Um, and so, you know, just to give you a picture of that, but I have added this, this uh, document on the screen that you see here. And it's one, it's, this is one of the many requests that Mexico received. And this was dated March 1st, 1833. And this was sent from the state, the local, the state government of Louisiana. And I'm gonna read it to you. It says this measure or this request has been provoked by the circumstances that have witnessed the desertion of slaves to Mexico to be increasingly frequent. And these desertions impede the recovery measures established before our authorities by our citizens of Louisiana, which prevent the prompt devolution of fugitive slaves to their owners. And now remember this is 1833, long before 1850. You know, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850. And so a lot of this, this uh, language was used in those, um, in, in, in that, um, in those laws and by each state that were attempting to return or, or get back people who had fled. But this one is, is, was as early as 1833 and the language is very similar. You know, they're running away to Mexico. They're, we're losing a lot of money. Mexico needs to return it to us. Or uh, some of these um, letters that I found in Mexico or petitions, um, they were saying different things like, you know, we need to ha have Mexico sign a treaty. Others like just, we need to get Mexico to pay us for people who, who flee because we're losing a lot of money. But time and time again, uh, as I was able to, to find in the archive, Mexico would uh, always stand against um, their anti-slavery uh, legislation. They were saying, we're not gonna return anyone. They never agreed to sign a treaty with the US because in Mexico, people that arrived there to claim freedom, they were free. And so they, Mexico never signed an extradition treaty with the US or with any local government. Interestingly enough, I do have to point out that uh, as opposed when we, to what we think about a Canadian freedom or Canadian safe havens, Canada did sign a treaty with the US um, for the extradition of people who had um, claimed freedom in Canada. So that is uh, you know, an important distinction that uh, I didn't learn growing up and I learned actually by doing this work. And so, but let's continue. But now let's go back to the question of the networks to freedom and who led this um, channels to liberation, this underground railroads south. Um, I have found that I diverse, you know, based on the records that I have mined in the US and in Mexico, I have found that a diverse pool of individuals and groups did a lot of the helping. Mexican people were certainly known to help both within the US and in Mexico. Sometimes Mexicans served as guides to cross people across the river. At other times, um, you know, local Mexicans offered food or, or raised money to give freedom fighters who arrived often with nothing um, to buy clothes and food and shelter. Um, this document, for instance, that you see right here, uh, cl clearly states that um, when a group of freedom fighters arrived in Mexico in this Mexican town, the townspeople, the local Mexicans gathered money. They gathered 246 pesos to give to this group of people who were fleeing enslavement so that they could continue on their journey because they, they wanted to continue walking to a place where they knew they were safe. They, they knew that they weren't be kidnapped or taken back to slavery. And so I've also found, you know, 
um, records in the US were references that Mexicans were aiding people. Um, a lot of the times uh, Mexican nationals were being ca called or considered as thieves because they were stealing um, people or coercing people to run away to Mexico. Um, I've also found here, as you may see, uh, Native people also were in the business of helping Black Americans to reach Mexican spaces. Although it is also important to note that um, certain Native groups were also in the business of enslavement. And so while uh, freedom fighters or you know, people leaving for Mexico were finding safe refuge or passage uh, or finding Native Americans who helped them, there were others who were finding um, the opposite. So there were some Native groups that um, would re-enslave them, send them back to, um, to their slave, own, to slave owners or um, sell them themselves back into slavery. And so I have found a wide variety of individuals who did the helping, who did the, um, the leading. But it is very important for the work that I've been doing to acknowledge one of the things that I have uh, been able to find about these networks to freedom, about these channels to liberation, as I call them. And that is that it were Black Americans, enslaved and free, who were the ones engineering these channels to liberation to Mexican spaces. Black people were very active in their pursuits for freedom at the many levels that um, this freedom materialized in Mexican spaces. They were leading the way, they were helping others. Um, they were, you know, Black women were leading this way as well. Once they, they reached Mexican spaces, uh, people were not just securing their own freedoms, but they were fighting for, to bring their families, to bring their children. Uh, they were helping, us, uh, helping and assisting others to, to come to Mexico. They were all also coming in and reporting uh, abductions, so kidnappings, you know, slave hunters would constantly cross the border into Mexico, Mexican spaces and looking for people who they consider were runaway slaves and they were kidnapping them and bringing them across the border, taking them back to enslave uh, their enslavers. And so uh, it were, you know, black Americans were doing that labor. They were very active in, in um, not only securing their own freedoms, but you know, assisting others, reporting kidnappings and all that. And so um, thousands did make it to safe havens in Mexican destinations, including this man that I have, for instance, um, in this slide, I have, I'm gonna show you a few of the uh, stories and narratives that I've been able to reconstruct about freedom fighters who are, you know, I situate black Americans who left the US for Mexican spaces to claim freedom as freedom fighters. So for instance, we have here the story of David Thomas who took his daughter and three grandchildren and went to Mexico. And his, um, in, in his petition, he said, para salvar a su familia de la esclavitud, he had left to save his family from a lifetime of enslavement. And we also have the story of John and Peter, for instance, we have, that I have right here. Peter and John uh, pursued their liberation they had been enslaved by their Cherokee enslaver um, in where it is today, Oklahoma. They had run away, made it to Mexico, and they had been free for a few months. But then a slave hunter, you know, a group of slave hunters kidnapped them, brought them back to San Antonio, where they put them in jail to await for their enslaver to come back in and get them. Um, again, they had to fight to be free. They broke away from jail, went back to Mexico, and went directly to the alcalde and said, hey, we had been free here for a few months. We just kidnapped, but we were managed to escape a second time. We're here in front of you to the local, they were telling the local alcalde because we want your, the protections of uh, the government. But not only that, we also want you to help us. Um, and you know, Peter said, this is Peter's, uh, John's dad. Um, Peter said, I also want you to help me bring my wife and the rest of my family who's still enslaved uh, by, by, Cherokee, uh, by a Cherokee community in Oklahoma. And so in these ways, it becomes very clear that Black Americans were the ones fighting for their freedom and making Mexico accountable for the freedom that their laws offered. So they had to fight for that and they had to navigate those the spaces and those laws to ensure that um, not only themselves were free, but, but their families were also could also secure that freedom. And so before I conclude, um, I know it's, it's been quite a, a 
a long presentation, I do want to talk to you about a, a couple more freedom fighters. This, uh, for instance, here, I wanted to talk to you about Matilda Hens. Matilda was a Black woman who was born enslaved in Louisiana, and she escaped her enslaver in the late 1840s, and she made it to um, Tamaulipas. She was living in Reynosa or outside in the outskirts of Reynosa. She was able to get a job, um, and she was living in uh, work, working and living uh, at the ranch of a Mexican man called Manuel Luis El Fierro. And so uh, she had been living there with her daughter, um, Harriet, who was six years old. And you can see here, she was just years old. They had run away. And if you see the slides, they had run away from Edward Cheney. And um, they had been living free in Mexico, creating and engineering that life and uh, li a life in freedom. And unfortunately, a group of slave hunters, including the enslaver, broke into the ranch one night. They, 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 with the help of Mexican slave hunters, because it is also very important to acknowledge that Mexicans were also, you know, while there were you know, Mexicans that were helping people uh, to be free, there were also some Mexicans that were in the business of slave hunting. And with the help of um, some slave hunters from the US and Mexico, the enslaver was able to find out where Mat Matilda and Harriet were living. So they, they went to that ranch, illegally crossed into Mexico. They went to the ranch and uh, you know, in the middle of the night, they tried to kidnap Matilda and her daughter to bring them back to a slavery. But she, at that point, she woke up, she started yelling and fighting, literally fighting with her hands um, and screaming for assistance. The local Mexicans came to her aid. Her employer uh, came to her aid with a gun and they were able to take the slaveholder um, to jail that night. And this is why we know about Matilda's experience because she left her testimony of what had happened um, to her. And so, so part of her testimony was I found in Matamoros, the other part I found in Mexico City and other parts of her life and experience I found it in uh, US archives. And so beyond Matilda, you know, this is, and I can talk to you a little bit more about in Q&A, many others were making their way to Mexico. Um, individuals were running uh, in groups. Sometimes they were running individually. Um, other times they were finding connections, as I mentioned, people were helping them, Mexican, Native, um, other free Black persons were helping them. And um, one of the stories that I was able to recover was of this Mexican man who had been living in South Texas for many, many years with a woman, uh, with a Black woman who, had, who was enslaved. Um, in 1842, they had been living as husband and wife for about 10 years. And in 1842, they decided to make it for Mexico and you know, claim freedom. Unfortunately, um, they were caught right before they crossed the La Vaca River and the Mexican man was lynched on the spot and his uh, wife was returned to enslavement. And so um, this story was very hard to uh, recover from the archives because it was a very powerful and in the sense to say that people were fighting at times to death to be free uh, or to help others reach freedom. And it is important to note that even when people may have not made it across the river or they may have died before they reach freedom, their stories are also part of my study. Their stories are part of these shared histories of the US and Mexico, even when they, you know, their freedom fight was cut short. Uh, either by slave hunters or because they didn't make it, or even those people that decided not to flee, they were still fighting to be free at the very many levels that they could fight for that freedom. And so I wanted to conclude by saying briefly about uh, Black Mexican communities in Mexico or Black Mexicans um, uh, past and present. You know, these histories are very le relevant today because these are histories that not, are not just, uh, do not just exist in the past. Black Mexicans are uh, still in Mexico. They are not something of the past. They're there, they're fighting. This freedom fight or what I call la lucha, uh, the struggle um, was not something of the past. It continues in the ways that they are fighting for access to not only for visibility, but access to resources, access to the vaccine. Um, even today in Mexico, a lot of it, it is mostly the underrepresented communities, Afro-Mexican communities who have um, who who 
are the last uh, communities to, access, to have uh, access to the vaccine, for instance, in our present day. Um, but it is black communities in Mexico. It is black women that I've seen, uh, black Mexican women that are leading the fight to recover their stories to recover their history, their traditions, um, and to preserve the preservation of those histories. And here you see me with um, uh, some members of the Mascogos uh, who are, um, you know, live, you know, historically petitioned for land in Mexico in places like El Nacimiento de los Negros. And uh, in 1850, in the 1850s, Mexico um, officially gave them lands and those lands continue to be uh, belong to the, the, their descendants and they still live there. They hold uh, festivals every year. Um, some of the members of those communities by reconstruction by the 1890s and the 20th century, some of them moved back to the US where they established a sister city called Brackettville. And, um, but throughout this, this period and these histories, their histories are so intertwined that communities in Mexico like the Mascogo celebrate Juneteenth because they are celebrating freedom for uh, their, their respective families that moved back to the US or you know, family members that were enslaved at some point across Texas and across the US um, because it is also part of their heritage. And so I wanted to leave you with that to say that um, this freedom fight is not something only of the past. Um, it is um, a lucha that continues particularly to challenge um, anti-blackness and to really fight against the erasure of black Mexican history and uh, black roots that a lot of us, you know, born and raised in Mexico, I did not learn about uh, um, black Mexicans, Mexico's black roots. And so I think this is a fight that we continue into the present and that is very relevant to our today and the processes that we witness every day particularly across the border. And so thank you so much. And uh, yeah, appreciate your time. Wow, that's all I can say is wow. <laughs> thank you for such an insightful and truthful presentation. Um, I know we've been a little bit over time, but I enjoyed every minute of it. So before we begin our formal Q&A part of the program, I have a first question. How did you come to study this particular history of the Americas? Thank you so much. And first I have to say, I know I, I went over time because the first, my notes went away. And so I was, I was trying to find them. So I apologize for, for making it longer than I, I, I originally intended. But so I, I came to this, uh, topic and these histories because you know at the beginning I, I was I was born and raised in Mexico I did not learn any of these histories I grew up not knowing that there were black Mexicans uh, that there were black people in Mexico at all and so I ended up in the U.S. as many uh, you know immigrants I ended up in North Carolina and when I was able to finally you know have papers and go to school I enrolled at East Carolina University and I was taking my first class of the history of the Old South. And I was fascinated because these are stories that I didn't learn growing up. I was learning about Harriet Tubman. I was learning about the Underground Railroad. And I was being taught by uh, my first ever black professor. And so when I was hearing about Harriet Tubman, I really just, it came into my head and I really wanted to know who was the Harriet Tubman who led people to Mexico. And that's one of the questions that I, I raised my hand and I said, hi, can you, you know, can you tell me how many people went to Mexico? Can you tell me who led people to Mexico? And my professor looked at me very seriously and said, um, that's a very good question, Maria. If you find out, let me know. And I was just so shocked because this is a professor that I, you know, that was an expert in African-American history, you know, and he didn't know the answer. And, but he also motivated me to go find the answer. And so I began searching. Um, I really did, couldn't find a lot of secondary sources, but I did find one book called um, by John, John Hope Franklin uh, called Runaway Slaves, uh, which is a very hefty book. And in one, it was like two sentences, 
in this one paragraph that he wrote that he said people went to Mexico to claim to be free. And that's all I needed. That was the validation that I needed to continue searching and fighting. And I had the opportunity to make some trips to Texas before I got into the PhD to do some research for my master's. And I ended up doing a master's thesis on this. And, um, and that has led me to this journey of, you know, looking for the, re looking and recovering the experiences of people who claim freedom in Mexico. Uh, in Texas archives, in Louisiana archives, all across the South. Uh, I've even gone to Canada to do research in those archives and certainly spent a lot of time in Mexican archives um, trying to find these histories. And as you can tell, I have found a lot, uh, but that is how I came to this work, uh, mainly because um, I had an amazing professor who challenged me to find the answers to the questions that I had, uh, to questions that I never you know, to, to, to things that I didn't learn growing up and that uh, truly did bother me. Um, so, and I hope that answered your question. Absolutely, thank you for your work. <laughs> so um, I know we're supposed to end at 145. Well, I think it goes to two. So everyone who wants to stay for the Q and A, now I will introduce um, our librarian, Jamie Johnson, and our Bradley Center archivist, Zena Munoz Choto, to handle the Q&A portion of this presentation. Thank you. Hi, yes, thank you. I see a couple of hands raised. Um, James Henry, I saw your hand raised first. Do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, I, I, um, I kind of wanted to know what was the impetus, if you will, for Mexico to allow uh, people from the United States to start to come to uh, Texas in the first place? Thank you. That, that's a wonderful question. And I have uh, had the same question for the longest time. So in a lot of the, the letters and, and the records that I found, um, Mexico comes off very triumphant, like we are against slavery, we are, you know, are morally better, we are challenging US, the US um, uh, and their hold to slavery. And I think that in many instances, that is very self-serving. Uh, I think that politically Mexico wanted to um, situate a narrative that benefited them politically, um, uh, particularly in the context of the US. They certainly did not want to get the US more angry, but for instance, maybe this can help, help uh, clarify. Um, during this uh, meetings of the Anti-Slavery Convention in Philadelphia, uh, Mexicans were attending this and reporting back to Mexico, sending letters saying, hey, this happened today. This is what we should do. We should definitely support Black Americans. We should support uh, abolition. And then after like long letters, and this was um, 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 Joaquin Manuel Castillo y Lanzas, who was the charged affairs or the uh, minister of foreign affairs uh, from Mexico in the US. He was sending all these letters saying, we need to support uh, black abolition. We need to support our brethren. We need to do this and this. And then at the end, he would always be like, but we need to make sure we don't get the US angry. Like we need to do it, you know, in a way that we, you know, we don't get repercussions. So I think that it's hard to answer what the motivations were, but certainly I think it was a lot of political um, self-service and, um, what I really do see was that even in this process of abolition that where you can see the gradual abolition, legal abolition that was being procured, um, a lot of the times it was just all paper, but on the ground, it didn't really you know, work until Black Americans arrived and started making you know, those last work for them by the, the way that they were fighting for the protections, by the way that they were accessing, accessing citizenship. And so it really was, um, you know, Black Americans who were shaping as well Mexican freedom in, in that sense, also Mexican abolition, even when Mexico may have passed these laws, um, you know, as political, um, um, legislation, you know, for political uh, purposes. But um, so that's what I see. And, and I hope that answers your question. 
All right, I see another hand raise. Uh, Professor Marquez, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Jamie. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Hammock, for this presentation. I wholeheartedly enjoy it, enjoyed it. And, and um, this is something that um, is, is very, you know, it's very dear to me because I've, I've done a, you know, I've, I'm very interested in, in uh, discussions of resistance to, to enslavement. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, as, having grown up in the United States, I attended primary, uh, uh, um, a school, at least elementary school, where the majority of the population was African-American. So I was very uh, fortunate mm -hmm. to receive a fair amount of education in African-American topics. So I grew up listening about Harriet Tubman and, and all these, you know, these, these um, freedom fighters. Um, but this, this was a very new topic to me. Um, a few years ago when I learned, uh, I, I hadn't even thought about it. Um, and, but when I learned about it, I was, I, you know, I thought it made perfect sense. You know, it's, it can't just be the North. It's, it's, you know, it's, it was, there also had to have been a way because of Texas and close proximity to the United States and all that. Um, but I, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is um, what, um, in, over the course of my class, we, we've looked at, uh, we actually looked at a few documents from the slavery era, era in the United States, especially the early slavery era. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them was um, a, a, actually a letter that certified that somebody was free, right? So I guess my question is, what, um, what uh, kinds of documents um, did you have to look through besides legal documents, right? Court documents and testimonies and things like that. What other kinds of documents did you look through in the archives? And um, were these documents, um, I guess, did you experience any challenges in finding them? Did you experience any sort of resistance from the archivists themselves? Were, were, were these documents that were difficult to access? Uh, and also my second question is, um, Given the numbers of 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 enslaved of, of enslaved freedom fighters that ran to Mexico that ran away to Mexico or or escaped to Mexico, um, mm -hmm. what kind of, of of places in society did they come to fill? Um, you know, once they were in, in 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 Mexican spaces, what kinds of social and economic um, places did they come to sort of um, live in? Thank you um, mm -hmm. for those two wonderful questions. So about the first, um, so what I found, Mexico didn't just offer uh, per se, I haven't found like freedom papers because Mexico did not do like, they were free because of laws. You know, they, as soon as they said put on Mexican soil, it was the law that they were free. So nobody needed to ask them, you know, for their papers per se as we come to understand today. Um, but I've been able to find um, records uh, and there's other scholars that are doing this work as well. Uh, Jorge Delgadillo has really mined Mexican archives, particularly I think he does Puebla, I believe, or Guanajuato, where he has traced this, uh, um, you know, through records and ancestry of like birth records and follow, you know, how they identify. So if that's part of that, uh, it doesn't really answer you know, their status or like their free status, but um, he has done a lot of that work that is very um, uh, fascinating as well that traces lineage and traces, you know, um, uh, Afro-Mexicanos in the sense of being present in Mexico, even when um, they, they're, they may have not been able to, you know, um, show their racial origin, you know, he would say being able to trace that. Um, about the documentation that I have found and how I have accessed it, it's truly been a challenge, uh, both in the US and Mexico. In, in different aspects, I guess, um, in the US, we still have um, I've experienced um, a lot of gatekeeping, um, particularly as a woman of color trying to access archives. Um, it has uh, certainly been difficult in some places where even you know, places like Louisiana, archives that I know have people, uh, records of people who fled, um, you get there and um, a lot of the times they say, oh, we don't have anything when it's clearly that they do. So we face that um, gatekeeping, but also we face gatekeeping in the sense of um, cataloging, how people are cataloged. So in many instances across the US, when I'm looking for 
people that may have gone to Mexico, I cannot just go to an archive and say, hey, I'm looking for runaways to Mexico or people who claim freedom in Mexico. What I've had to ask is, I'm looking for so-and-so slaveholder. I'm working on the genealogy of this slaveholder or this slaveholding family. And then I, you know, once I have access to slaveholder records, then I've been able to find the people and people who may have left. And so, you know, I've also, you know, had to learn to navigate, you know, the archive, but also the gatekeeping and how, how things are cataloged. In Mexico, it was a little different, but still it comes from the sense, uh, it's the same gatekeeping that I, I, I found. Um, one of my experiences, for instance, in the Archivo um, Historico Militar in Polanco, when I went in there, you know, I'm a dual, you know, now I have sit, uh, dual citizenship. I was able to keep my Mexican citizenship, um, particularly when I got married. So I'm like, I, I was able to have both passports. So I went in there, you know, you don't, sometimes I don't think I'd show my American passport and they didn't let me enter. They were like, we don't have anything, you know, I'm sorry, we can't help you. And so I was like, what do you mean you can't help me? You know, uh, so I left defeated that day. They really gave me, and I just wasn't thinking of, hey. So the next day I came back as a Mexican with my Mexican passport and I said, es parte de mi patrimonio, yo necesito entrar uh, acceso a estos archivos, uh, you know, you can't deny a Mexican access, right, this is part of our history, and they were nicer, they actually said, okay, this is the process, you actually need to email um, the director of archive, and it can take uh, four to six business days, um, but you, you'll receive, if they give you access, you'll receive a letter, so I did all that process, it took about a week, but I got the letter, that said, you have access, you can come in. So I get there, get, get through all those hurdles, getting to the, the actual archive building. And then the archivist was like, so what are you looking for? And I was like, well, I'm looking for people who arrived from the US who you know, claim freedom, you know, mostly you know, black people, uh, how they lived, if they lived here, you know, how they got, the military helped them or not. And he just looked at me like, I was crazy. He was like, oh, we have nothing here. But I mean, you got access, so you can see, so led me into the, the room and he's like, have fun. And I was the only person there. And he, but I, at least I got access. Um, but it was really hard because then I had to like start from book one and go through and see what was there. So those are the two experiences that I've had across the US and Mexico that are um, very different, but come from the same, you know, it's, it's gate, gatekeeping that are, at times we find across both borders. Um, and as, as you know, if you're very interested in resistance, you mentioned to find those instances of resistance, uh, to find those records have been truly a challenge. Um, sometimes it's just following records, uh, following, you know, Norteamericanos que llegaron a cierta ciudad. And so I'm like, okay, if they arrive there, maybe they were slave hunters or maybe there's notices or so I started mining in Mexican archives anything to do with North Americanos and I mean it took a long time but you find people that way you know you, you find reports uh, for instance that's how I found um, reports of uh, slave hunters coming into Coahuila there were a lot of instances where they were coming in trying to kidnap people that were free and there were um, uh, altercations and American, you know, slave hunters would die because people would refuse to come. And so the authorities would have to send letters to Mexico City saying, by the way, an American died today, un americano, un norteamericano murió hoy because he tried to take a person, you know, that he was claiming was his slave. And so that's how I've been, I was able to find reports in Mexico of norteamericanos. So uh, that was a way that I was able to find records by mining anything that had norteamericano. For the second question, um, so some of the ways that I've been able to um, better understand or very engage of, of the traits that people or the spaces that people were feeling where they were settling, how they were engineering life and community down there um, is you know, finding, for instance, um, or tracing, for instance, uh, where they arrived, um, the jobs that they they read, you know, they were able to attain, 
um, I was able to find um, a lot. So a lot of them served as uh, translators, you know, because most of the individuals that were arriving, as opposed to the ideas that we have that perhaps people, you know, runaway slaves per se, did not know anything about their spaces they were running across or the language, because that is also a question that I get often, you know, how did they manage to, to, to live in a place where they didn't speak the language? But for instance, mining through runaway slave ads in the US, you start seeing patterns of like, so-and-so run away and, and this person can speak English, Spanish, and French. There were thousands of runaway slave advertisements that said individuals spoke English, Spanish, and French. And so it was clear that people could speak the language, they could communicate. And a lot of the times I would find the traits, people were, were working for the military, they were working uh, for the local alcaldías, they were being, you know, working as translators. Uh, I found a lot of people that were, um, had a businesses, established business as barbers. Um, I found one particular woman who established her own butter business in as early as the late 1820s in Coahuila where Butter was not a commodity in Coahuila at that time, but I, you know, I'm pretty sure, and I'm still with that argument because I haven't found a lot of other. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still doing work on her, but uh, that she was the person who introduced butter uh, to that to that space, and so I've been I've been finding it in a lot of places and through looking at records, such as for instance, reports of complaints, for instance, in Matamoros, um, there were complaints of local people. And this also comes to highlight the ways that some Mexican communities uh, re, you know, were uh, anti-Black because for instance, a lot of the reports that I found in Matamoros were people complaining about so-and-so who recently arrived from the US who was a former slave was a vago. And there were laws against vagos or against vagrants. Um, and so they were being reported because they couldn't find jobs. And so you start seeing, you know, um, more about their experiences and how they fit in or how they construct the communities. And so, but also that also allowed me to see that um, there were very many diverse ways that people build community or adapted to a community. Sometimes people would go where there were black communities like El Nacimiento or Matamoros or Veracruz, uh, but others didn't. Others just settled where they felt safest. Some people made it to places like Guanajuato, Guadalajara, Campeche, Mexico City. Um, a lot of people didn't stay across the border. Some did, like the, the Masco stayed across the border, meaning that's where they gave them, um, the Mexican government offered them land. But people were reaching spaces and becoming part of those communities in the very many ways that they could. Um, and so I, I hope that that answers your question. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I, I think uh, it, it brings to mind um, to, I guess, to make because I, I try in my I try in my classes to make it contemporary to, to try to compare it to something more contemporary so that they can sort of familiarize that there's origins to things, right? And and so I think this this these responses in in Mexican communities along the border, um, and and the responses and attempts to sort of integrate themselves to society kind of remind me of 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 the the groups of refugees from 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 the Caribbean, such as Haiti, um, that have found refuge um, along the the U.S. Mexico border. Uh, my own experience is seeing that in Mexicali in Baja California. Uh, but um, I'm sure it's like that throughout, you know, the, the Mexico's northern border um, uh, of these attempts to see to see individuals integrate into society and try to um, essentially become a part of it rather than sort of rather than existing as outsiders, um, try to exist as part of the community. Uh, yeah, and, and I should say one more thing. Um... There were certainly a lot of families um, and individuals who came back after 1865 when, when freedom was offered in the US, many did come, but others didn't. Um, I, I look into a family who, who remained in Mexico. They, they, they stayed, they had very, they, they created this business, businesses trade in trade and they became very successful to where by the, um, 
by the 1920s, their children had transnational businesses in Brownsville and in, um, in Mexico. So, you know, you start seeing people who decided to stay and, and forge this, this life in Mexico and become, by then they were identifying as Mexicans, you know, they, they, they just became Mexican. Um, but others, they decide to come back and move, move back to the US, but then they become sort of like this um, passing. A lot of these people that return became also knowing that, oh, they're Mexicans, even though they, when they arrived in Mexico and they were black Americans, but then by US emancipation, now they became um, Mexicans crossing the border back to the US. If, you, if, you, if that makes sense, like this passing also had a lot of um, power in this mobility, you know, uh, and, and they, the way that people identify once they had been in Mexico and they had adopted Mexican ways and they had become black Mexicans, but their identity became this identity of passing as Mexican. And, um, and so that's why I think it leads to how important it is today. A lot of, um, you know, black Mexicans or Mexicans that know that they have African heritage uh, or black roots, they, they are actively trying to recover those roots um, to, to, to better inform the way that their families pass across or cross these borders. Thank you, Dr. Hammack. And as we're wrapping up, we do have one last question in the chat um, from Casey Blackman. It's a fantastic presentation. I wonder what connection between Texas's stance on slavery versus the rest of the US stance on slavery and Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas. Perfect, yes. Um, can you repeat the question? It's like about the connections or about the... the... Yeah, the connection. And um, feel free, Casey Blackman, if you would like to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, it was a uh, connection between Texas's stance on slavery versus um, the US stance on slavery. Okay, thank you. Yes, so as I... Um, try to explain that very well because that's when my notes were um, had disappeared from me. But uh, so Texas is a very unique space in the sense that um, when Mexico secured dependence, Texas was a Mexican space. And as a Mexican space that uh, it became one of anti-slavery. So Mexico was in the process of abolishing slavery. So those laws apply to Texas. Now, during that same time, as early as 1823, because Anglo settlers were being allowed into Texas and the Stephen Austin's um, contract to settle in Texas was approved in 1823 by the Mexican government. When the, the, the contract was approved, it did not have anything pertaining to slavery and mainly because at that point in 1823, Mexico hadn't abolished slavery, but it was in the process of passing laws. As you see, this is 1823 when the contract was approved and they passed the, the anti, um, the slave trade, the anti, the, the slave trade law in 1824. And so this created a lot of problems in Texas, mainly because here's a, a space where slavery is being abolished legally, but then Anglo settlers are moving and bringing in enslaved people illegally and extra legally. And, and I say extra legally because sometimes they were bringing them illegally even in spite of the laws because they were going through places where there were no Mexican officials. And so it was easy to access Texas without being stopped by the Mexican, um, uh, uh, I guess what would be the Mexican authorities uh, patrolling the border or the, the space. Um, in other times, they were just drafting these contracts where if they were stopped by Mexican officials saying, hey, you can't bring sla uh, slaves. And they were saying, oh, no, no, they're not slaves. They are free people. Here's their contracts. They're willingly signed this contract saying that they want to be uh, servants for 99 years. And so, but they were finding ways to circumvent. So this continued to brew and create a lot of animosity to the point that by the time so 1824, Mexico passed that law that prohibited the introduction of slaves into the country. Then they passed um, a law in 1829 that abolished slavery. And then they passed um, the law in 1830 that they prohibited Anglo immigration into Texas. And all these laws were really to deter 
Texas from becoming a slave country, which as we come to find out um, in the early 1830s, you know, Anglo settlers were going to Mexico to try to convince Mexico to, particularly after 1829, to, you know, get rid of the abolition of slavery laws. And partially they were successful because Mexico did give that exception to Texas where just to, to keep a rebellion from happening. But as we all know, rebellion happened in 1836 and, you know, Texas did break away from Mexico because of the issue of slavery. And, um, and they decided, you know, Texas became, uh, you know, uh, as, Stephen Austin wanted a slave country. It became this republic that, that stood to protect uh, slavery, chattel slavery. And it restricted free black people from living in, in the space. It restricted Mexicans from living within a proximity of enslaved people because Mexicans were being seen and understood as people who help uh, uh, runaways or who were stealing runaways and leading them to freedom. And so certainly Texas was shaped by these contentions um, of slavery and freedom. You know, Mexico was trying to forge this freedom space, but slaveholders really didn't want to free people that they, that they claimed as slaves because they were very profitable and they really couldn't afford to lose them. A perfect example that I have found is, um, and you know, Coming to Texas for my PhD, I really didn't know a lot about Texas except for what I had learned. And I had this idea of Sam Houston as a slaveholder. But I arrived in Texas and I realized that a lot of people actually have this idea that, that uh, Texas heroes were, were against slavery, that Sam Houston was against slavery. But that's not what I have found in records. Sam Houston owned slaves. On one occasion, he had purchased two men uh, for $1,500. And, and I found this record not in Texas. I found this record um, in North Carolina, actually, at the Wilson Library, where he had purchased two slaves for $1,500. And he was quite upset writing a letter saying, I had just purchased them and they just ran away to Mexico. He is writing to a friend saying, hey, I need your help to go get them because I cannot afford to lose them um, or to lose that money. I'm going to go broke. And so here you start seeing this, these dynamics that Texas heroes were definitely in the business of slavery and pr the protection of slavery to the point that they were willing to cross the Mexican border illegally to retrieve people that were by all laws and decrees free. Not only that, years later, I actually came across another glimpse of the other side of the story in Mexico, um, this general, the, at, at some point he had been, um, and I think it was like during the siege of New Mexico, he had been caught, this was an, an Anglo um, settler, he had been caught trying to take over New Mexico, he was taken to, to Monterrey, and then to, Tama, to Tam, Matamoros, um, and in Matamoros he actually met one of these individuals who had run away from, from Sam Houston, and he talked to him and he wrote about it in his diary. And he basically says, uh, oh, I met so-and-so who, who ran away from Sam Houston. And he, this is what he said about Sam Houston. And so this man, his name was Tom. And he actually told him the story that, you know, he had run away from, from Houston because he could not. And I think if I'm remembering the quote, he could not concede to continue being the slave of such a, um, unscrupulous monster. He calls them Houston an unscrupulous monster. And so that he ran away because he wanted to be free from Houston. And so these are some of the stories that I've been able to retrieve that really shed light on Texas slavery and how you know Texas slavery was really not much different from how shadow slavery was across the South. So in many ways, I do argue that Texas was part of the U.S. South. It was part of the slave South. And so um, I hope that, it, you know, offers you some uh, answers to the questions that you asked. Thank you. Well, uh, in closing, uh, we would like to all thank Dr. Hammock today for your wonderful presentation and your research. We applaud you and thank you for sharing your details today.
Um, I would also like to thank Keith Rice from the Bradley Center and the University Library for sponsoring and putting together this program today. Um, Guillermo Marquez's class for attending. We appreciate you and all the attendees. Um, I would also like to thank Zina Munoz Stroto for being here and for running our Zoom event today. Thank you so much. And then also our interpreters um, who are here today sponsored by Deaf Studies. Thank you all. And um, we look forward to the next presentation. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and share this, this with you.